I get it. I get it. You don't like Calvinism. You used to be a part of Calvinism. You Maybe your church was and you left it and you feel invigorated. It was the best thing that ever happened to you. Fine. That part is okay. I'm not a Calvinist. So let me just say this to those of you who all of the different videos that we see out there where they say I've left Calvinism or why I left Calvinism or Calvinism ruined my life. Calvinism is dangerous. Calvinism is wicked. Calvinism is evil. Can I just cost you, can I just give you a piece of advice? Stop saying silly things. It is perfectly fine to disagree with Calvinism. I do. I'm not a Calvinist. Now, there are some things, there are some tenets of Calvinism that I do agree with. There are some that I disagree with. There are some tenets of Calvinism that even you people who disagree with Calvinism also agree with. The issue is, though, how you caricature Calvinism might be, you know what, maybe for some people it might even be sinful. To say that Calvinism is wicked, to say that it's evil, that must mean, it necessarily means that you don't either understand Calvinism or understand the Bible. Again, I don't I don't agree with everything about all the tenets of Calvinism. I don't agree with all five points of two. Do they have some merit? Sure, on some of the things. And are they at least using scripture to back up their points? Yes, they are. Are you, are you using scripture to back up your point? Hopefully, are you using scripture to say that it is evil, wicked, that it ruins your life? No, you're not. All we're saying is that for anyone who wants to be a believer in Christ, Remember, that's the point. If you want to be a believer in Christ, what do you have to do? Place your faith in Christ. That is genuine faith. And non-Calvinists and Calvinists alike all agree that that's required. What Calvinism seeks to do is to explain how this process happened. In other words, not what you did, what we did, but what God did. Now, whether they get it right or wrong, it doesn't have a really a bearing that much of a bearing on you placing your faith in Christ as far as you're concerned. Why do I say that? Because when you place your faith in Christ, if you did place your faith in Christ, you didn't go through this, this thought process that I'm doing so because the Lord is causing me to do so. Whether that's true or not, you didn't think that not, not the Calvinist didn't do so, the Arminian didn't do so, no one did so. And so your faith, if it's a genuine faith, is because you recognized how fallen you are and that salvation can only be in what Christ's atoning work on the cross can bring. That's it. Now, you step back and you try to take an academic or biblical look as to why these things happen. Okay, I think this happened because God sovereignly moved on me and caused me, he chose me before time, before the earth was, to be saved. Whether you believe that or not, it doesn't mean that it's dangerous. No one is ever going to fall away from the Lord because they are a Calvinist. No one is going to be, no, you're not saved by being a Calvinist. A person, if you believe you can lose your salvation, which you cannot, they won't do so because of Calvinism. How does Calvinism hurt your walk? I have no idea. There are those that think that Calvinists think that you can just live how you want to live just because God has predetermined these things. Now, there are some that I think go a little too far uh, those that are, are hyper determinists who think that God determined everything, determined the color of shirt that I would decide to put on, decide how many uh, packs of sugar I would put in my coffee. Th that That's a bit much. But does, does that harm someone's walk? Tell me how that harms someone's walk now. Telling someone that Jesus is not God, does that harm someone's walk? Yeah, that harms someone's walk. Telling someone that they can be oppressed, depressed, uh, controlled by a demon and still have the spirit of God in them. Does that harm someone's walk? Yeah, that harms someone's walk. To tell someone that there are other ways to come to God other than through Christ? Yeah, that harms someone. To tell someone that what's happening in your life, you can just simply wave it away or you can call those things that are not as though they were. Does that harm that person's walk? Yeah, that harms that person's walk. So those are the things that we need to call out. Anything that harms a person's walk, these destructive heresies, meaning it takes them away from following Christ. Calvinism does not take you away from following Christ. Calvinism attempts to explain why the believer follows Christ, and they might be right, they might be wrong. But there are just some things that we need to just be adults about and not say that Calvinism is evil, it's wicked, any of those things or that Calvinism ruined my life. No, if your life was ruined because of Calvinism, that's your own walk. And now you're looking to place blame somewhere else. So I wish that we would stop that. The incessant videos after videos after videos after videos to say that Calvinism is wicked. How about you send, you spend some time 
talking about how your philosophy, how your view, how your doctrine, how your points uh, line up with scripture. And I don't have a problem with you disagreeing with Calvinism. There are points that I disagree. I had videos where there are certain points that I disagree with Calvinism. There are certain points where I agree with Calvinism, such as uh, God's sovereign election. You don't have to be a Calvinist to believe that because Calvinists believe that and a non-Calvinist believe that it doesn't make the non-Calvinist a Calvinist. I think these points are pretty clear, pretty solid in scripture. We need to go only just to John 3. As a matter of fact, even before we get to John 3, the Bible in the Old Testament tells us what God is going to do. You can't get around what God said he's going to do in places like Ezekiel 36 or going back further, Deuteronomy 30, Jeremiah as well. But he says that I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my, I'll take the heart of stone out and put the heart of flesh. I will sprinkle clean water on you. So he uses those two elements, water and spirit, to signify what's happening in the person's heart. And then Jesus brings this up again in John 3, saying that a person must be born again, born of water and spirit, born from above, that is from the spirit. And then in verse 8 of John 3, he says that, uh, do not marvel or amaze that I say that you must be born again. He says, and he gives an analogy where the wind blows, where it wishes, and you hear where the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Being born of the Spirit is not something that you do. It's something that the Lord does. And that's why Peter says, God caused us to be born again. If you're born again, that's an act of the Lord. That's not you. And this cause to be born again is something that happens uh, to keep us believing. And we know it's not just Israel because Jesus says in John 1 that he used the word hasoi, which is to say that all the people, whoever it happens to be that is born, that person, and by, by the way, that's all inclusive of Jews and Gentiles, that person is born not of blood, not of flesh, not of the will of man, so not of your genealogy, uh, not of your own decision, not of the will of man, but you are born. And so notice what he says in John 12, but as many, the word hasoi that I just mentioned, as received him, those that received him, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe. And he used this word pistosusin, which is those that are believing, which must necessarily ha happen. I mean, that happens because you have been born again. You have, you, have a, you have a new heart. He says, so those who are believing in his name, who were born, uh, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man. So not because of your own will. So, so you're not born again because of something that you did. That's what he's saying, but you're born uh, again. Why? How? Because of the will of God. Ek feu, ek and so this this is clear. This is clear. By the way, this is aorist, so it's a past tense, and it's passive, which means it happened to you. This is not a result of your own. Does that make me a Calvinist? No, it does not, uh, because I because I stand with that because I believe what that Ephesians one is telling me that God has chosen us to be in Him. He says, just as He chose us. To be in him before the foundation of the world just just i would think just basic not just greek but also english where we have a direct object and an indirect object look what it says that um even though he exiloxatai which is he has chosen us this is a heiress middle indicative so it was done for the benefit of god god does this to us for his benefit and look what he says us the us is in the accusative and the in him uh, is in the dative. So therefore, we have a direct object and the indirect object. Who is the direct object? Well, the direct object is he chose us, us, the direct object. And then the indirect object is in him, to be in him. So he chose us in him, the indirect object. And so just grammatically speaking, it's clear that the choosing of us to be in him or in him, that happened when, as he says, pra katabale is before the foundation of the world. I don't. So you mean I have to be a non-Calvinist uh, to reject that, or a Calvinist can only accept that? No, I accept that as well. I think is I think it's pretty clear. Now, do I believe everything that Calvinists believe? No. One of the things I disagree with is limited atonement. I think that atonement piggybacks off of what the Old Testament atonement looks like, the Old Covenant atonement looks like, and that means that atonement was made available, propitiation was made available for everyone, whether they accepted it or not. It was made available, and then their faith in what was happening, them afflicting themselves and humbling their souls, and then accepting what was done, caused them to be in right standing with the Lord. And then we get to a place like John 1, uh, 1 John 2, 2, where he says, and 
Uh, matter of fact, let's start in verse one. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, and he himself is the propitiation. This word, halasmas, the same word that's used of the atonement in the Old Testament. He is the propitiation of our sins. Who sin? Those of us that believe, those of us that are saved. And so he says, not just our sins only. Well, who's the our sins? Us believers but also for those of the whole world. And this whole world is, is, is important. Halu to Cosmo, which means all of the world, the whole of the world, not just ours that are say us that are saved, but also those of the world. The problem is the world won't accept this. And so that's one of the main reasons why I reject uh, limited atonement. And then also the general Calvinist view of total depravity. I can reject those things and still not believe that Calvinism is not evil, wicked, that it can ruin someone's life that is from a pit of hell. No, because there are some things that Arminians believe that I do certainly believe that go against Scripture. There are those that are in, that are the hyper grace persuasion that I certainly disagree with. Those that are Arminian, those that are provisionists and so forth. And then some that are Calvinists. I think the one passage that is clear is John 10, where those will say that we can walk away from our own salvation. We can forfeit it, but it's clear. And the Greek is still the undefeated text. One of these texts, one of these portions, I would say, is the undefeated text in the Bible. This John 10, 28, where he says, I gave them eternal life and they will never perish. And he makes a statement, Ume Apollonti is the strongest way that Jesus could ever say that it is literally impossible for you to ever perish in the future. That's what a double negation of a subjunctive is. Double negation of a, of a subjunctive is the most emphatic way of negating the possibility of anything happening in the future. So you, so it naturally means that you cannot walk away on your own. You can't be snatched away. You can't start thinking differently. You can't follow anything differently. Jesus already said that his sheep will never, ever, ever follow a strange voice. So if someone is Arminian, well, then I think that that is a problem. I have more of a problem with that than... Uh, the Calvinistic view, because now you're talking about someone's confidence, their faith, the confidence that the writer of Hebrews says that you will have need of your confidence as the day goes forward. You need to know that the Lord is walking with you and in you and moving you, causing you, as, as Ezekiel says, to walk in his commands. And so now, am I going to make a video or should anyone else make a video that says that says that Arminianism is a lie from the pit of hell, it's dangerous, it's destructive? No, I don't think you should do that either. I think both if anyone does either, you're both just as culpable of this foolishness. Stop with the incessant foolishness of constantly saying that Calvinism is evil, wicked, destructive, that it harmed me. Why I left Calvinism. There's a thousand videos. I don't know why. I don't know why. Maybe because they weren't thinking in the first place. Are they thinking now? What's to tell us that you are? What's to give us any, any hope or trust in your thinking process now versus then? But perhaps the person matured and now they see the error of their ways, which is fine. But stop calling a brother or sister in the Lord evil, wicked, impugning them. If you place your faith in Christ, be you Calvinist, be you um, Arminian, be you provisionist, be you dispensational, whatever you might be, be you Pentecostal charismatic. If you place your faith in Christ, if you recognize your sins and that you cannot be saved on your own and you need a savior and you place your faith in what Christ did on the cross, the Bible says you are saved. How then can you turn around and say that that person is a wicked person, an evil person? You cannot. We have the same father. That is, if indeed you do have, have him as your father, then stop doing what you're doing. Now, if someone is doing something that's harmful to the body that we see, fine. But this, that's just foolishness. Amen.